Yeah, uh, thank you very much for for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it's a pity that I can't, can't come in, in person to the CERM in Lumini. I I have been there many many times, and I, I really like this this place. I think it's a fantastic area and a super nice institute, and a, a, yeah, also a big asset to the to the mathematics community. And therefore, I'm also very happy that I can contribute to this to this event at the at the sim. So, yeah, so I have uh, prepared. Uh, Four lectures and the lectures about uh, one hour, and then also uh, a tutorial session tomorrow. And for the tutorial session, uh, I think it's important that everyone um, installs on their laptop the uh, the TensorFlow in Python. So, what I would recommend if you haven't uh, installed Python at all, then to use the the Anaconda environment and to use a spider. Um, and if you want to implement uh, or install the, the TensorFlow, then you should look that you get, uh, it only works with certain versions of Python and that uh, always creates a bit of a hassle. Um, and probably you can help each other or so by uh, trying to, to get it installed. And that will be quite important to to, to do these exercises that I prepared for for tomorrow. But uh, so let's start with the with the theory lectures. And um, yeah, what I really enjoy is always if there's a lot of interactions. So you can either interrupt me, just say Johannes, I have a question, or you can uh, put something in the chat, and I will uh, monitor the chat during my lecture, and then respond to all your questions and that makes it very uh, yeah lively and uh, then it also not the, the difference is not as great uh, anymore as uh, with the compared to the um, in, uh, yeah lectures in person so okay let me get started and um, so um, when I started to to, to think about um, yeah, statistical properties of these deep neural networks. I think that was in 2015, 2016, so six, seven years ago. And um, then there was the, the general belief that uh, this is a new thing and that is um, so complex that there is no um mathematical uh, theory anymore and everything is driven by empirical research and uh, so what were the the main reasons to for this sort of uh, reasoning so first of all people argued that the problems for which deep neural networks are applied they are much more complicated than the simple statistical models that we typically study and in theory and uh, so that means uh, first of all one would even have to come up with much much more complicated statistical models and then uh, before one even could analyze the method um, and i think this argument one can say well that's right yeah so for instance the image nets if you want to classify cats versus dogs and so how do you write it down as a statistical problem that is of course a super complex thing but still one can look at uh, simpler statistical models as a sort of, um, yeah, um, if, so if, well, with the, with the idea that if the methods don't work for simple models, then there's something wrong with them, right? So, so here one can maybe do, uh, yeah, argue against this uh, reasoning. And then the second reason I think back then was um, that, um, Neural networks they only work if you combine them with a lot of very sophisticated uh, regularization methods such as the dropout. Maybe have heard about this, or the batch normalization and so on. And so to incorporate that into a mathematical theory that seems just uh, infeasible in a in, in a way. Um, and so this is still something. Uh, so the theory up to now, and I, I try to bring us uh, as far as I can within these four lectures, is still not there where we can analyze all these things um, 
but we work in under some sort of simplifying assumptions, which we believe don't really change the essence of the of the method, but uh, some sort of simplifying assumptions have to be have to be made, and that's a very crucial uh, step in the in the building a theory for for deep neural networks. And then there were other reasons, for instance, this is a deep neural networks, it's a nonlinear method, and that is always very tricky to, to analyze. Uh, as you probably know, like uh, nonlinear methods there, sometimes you can do something like a linearization, and then, uh, yeah, that's still something which is mathematically feasible, but if stuff that is really nonlinear is typically uh, very, very hard, or even not, uh, yeah, not much can be done in such situations. So that is another complication why people have said in the beginning, well, it's, yeah, you can't do any theory about this anymore. And the final thing is that we are not only the, the dependence on the parameters is nonlinear in this method, but also the, the generated function classes, there are also non-convex function classes. So all these things that we know about optimization uh, is mainly for for convex optimization, and then we, we have some convergence rates and so on, and all this doesn't work anymore. It breaks down if we have non-convex classes. So you see the, yeah, it seems absolutely hopeless to, to try to come up with some theory. And what is amazing now, looking back there five years later or so, that this is a quickly growing mathematical field where a lot of insights have been gained. And um, of course, the, the holy grail would be to have the yeah, incorporate in our theories everything that is done in deep learning, but somehow we always have to, to come up with some idealizations and so, but still I think we can understand a lot of these uh, phenomena and that really also helps the, the, the practitioners in a way. Uh, and then, of course, one can, okay, so great, we can do math, I, um, but uh, and of course you can always prove some sort of theorems and so, but the question is then also, suppose you can do a theory. What is then, what is then the, the, the yeah, what can you get out of such a theory for practice, for instance? And some of the, what I will the main arc. First of all, I think there's a general interest in understanding uh, how I would say the, the signal processing within a deep neural network works. Okay, so they often describe it as black boxes and what we want to do is we want to understand what happens really within such a, a black box that's uh, partially purely intellectual interest, but then also we can think about if we understand that we can maybe build something better or so. Um, so that's some, certainly something that is that is important. Um, I think another reason why we want to do that is we want somehow um, to write the and to present deep learning in a more coherent way. Yes, yeah, so um, there are thousands or hundreds of thousands of publications now on, on uh, deep learning and it's a completely chaotic field with uh, plenty of methods and and ideas and so, and um, some of them are useful, some of them are useful just for one specific data set and so on. And if we can extract a bit the, 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 the key concepts, and that's something which probably can be done based on a mathematical understanding, um, then we can also see, for instance, ways to overlap with other methods and so on, and we can present in a much better way to, to students and future generations. Yeah, so that's something which uh, is also, I think, quite quite important. And uh, I know a lot of people, they complain about the, 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 this amount of, of papers uh, that is uploaded on a daily basis on, on archive, on deep learning, so no one can track anymore, of, keep track of all of this, but somehow they all have a lot of things in common and these common concepts, I think that is the important thing that we should extract from, from all of this. Um, another thing is that one, yeah, for many tasks, we have other methods available. Yeah, so 
for instance, you probably have heard about uh, random forests or so for classification problems. And for simple classification tasks, often what you observe in practice that neural networks and um, the, the random forests, they behave a bit in the on the same level. So sometimes the random forests are a bit better, sometimes the neural networks are a bit better. Um, you will also see tomorrow during this tutorial that uh, if we compare to logistic regression, there's just a minor difference between the neural network performance and the uh, logistic regression and so on. So sometimes also simpler methods, they, they work well. And that is something which we want to better understand based on a, on a theory. So we want to be able to compare uh, different methods based on our theoretical understanding to say in which situation should you use what type of, of methods. Uh, why should you fit a neural network with 60 million parameters or so if you can just use a very basic method um, and then you get much easier your, your results and they're of the same quality. And then you can say, okay, yeah, you just try all these methods. But there's a, certainly a gain if you have some sort of insights that tell you right away, uh, give you some ideas on which type of method you should try first, maybe. Then uh, if you ask the practitioners, the computer scientists, so what, what do you want from a theory of deep learning, then they will always tell you that uh, it's a, a very painful process to, to search and for all these uh, tuning parameters that have to be selected when it's still learning great, but um, there are tons of other uh, tuning parameters that have somehow to be chosen. And um, uh, you yeah, have fitting a neural network, it's often something that's done, takes weeks or so, because you have tr to try many, many different setups, different network architectures, different types of depths with, and so on, and, uh, up, yeah until a point where you find a, a good neural network. It's also something we will try tomorrow during the tutorial. And then you see that the quite unstable versions where you uh, get uh, only crap and uh, very good network configurations and so on. And there's, uh, of course, people have some sort of uh, insights and uh, empirical understanding and so, but I think the, the idea is from that the theory can provide you some guidelines on how to choose all this uh, 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 network parameters. Um, uh, another point I think that is quite important to mention is uh, at this moment we are a bit still in the state where we think that uh, deep learning is great for for everything. And um, but I came across a lot of people who have tried, for instance, for a data set to fit a neural network, and they they tell me, well, I they, they they're working on this already for a year or so, and it's just not going to work. And um, if it doesn't work, you can't you can't publish it. But there are definitely problems where deep neural networks and deep learning is not working very well. But we can't see that really in the empirical research because uh, if it doesn't work well, it's typically not a publishable result. And I think here is something very important from what uh, mathematical theory can contribute, it can tell us a bit where the limitations are of these deep neural networks. That was also quite important already in this, uh, during the first hype of the neural networks where people have shown, for instance, that there's certain the, the logical OR function also cannot be implemented by a simple neural network. And that uh, it's often like a mathematical result that also uh, uh, stops uh, a certain uh, area that was the same with these uh, expert systems and, and so on. So, so that is uh, often often the case if you look back in history, that uh, at some point it comes someone with a mathematical uh, uh, limitation and then everyone understands and so okay, yeah, right, it's not so great for this and this and that. And that also uh, has a big impact on, on practice often. And if we understand limitations, of course, then that uh, also might help us to understand what has to be done to improve networks. At this moment, I think the empirical research tries, of course, a lot of things and new regularization techniques and so on. Um, and but the theory can lead us, of course, to different types of ideas on what we should try <coughs> to improve um, uh, neural networks performance. <coughs> 
And finally, what I think is now also getting more and more uh, important, for instance, in the area of inverse problems is that uh, people come up with hybrid methods. Okay, so what is a hybrid method is somehow, what do I understand is where you combine two different methods in, in a way, in a, in a non-trivial way. Okay, so you you split the problem in some way and then you, for, for one part of the problem, you apply one method and, and for another part of the problem, another method, or you first apply one method and then another um, method and so on. Um, and um, that is also based on an understanding where the limitations of a method are, right? So, and then you can, once you understand that, you can split it a bit up. And that is, for instance, for inverse problems, these sort of regularized inverses to, inverse to, to learn that from uh, from data with a neural network is, is infeasible and people use uh, traditional regularizers and then based on the regularized version to, for instance, to uh, get rid of artifacts and the reconstructions also based on the in the second step when they use the deep neural network. Okay, so here you see really that a more high level understanding of deep neural networks and what they can and what they cannot do and can help us to design uh, better methods that combine uh, different uh, different uh, techniques for instance. Okay, so that's a bit the, the overall framework of uh, why the mathematical or statistical theory for deep neural networks can be can be helpful. But I go on with the next uh, slide. So let me now come. Okay, so I can't see the slide. Now I can see it. So, so that's a, a short overview. Of course, there's so much on theory nowadays that this cannot be fit anymore within uh, these, these four lectures. Um, but I thought I select uh, based also on my personal interests a few topics. And first, uh, what I want to do is I want to go back a bit to the to the nineties. It was somehow the second uh, time where neural networks were very much on vogue, uh, as you probably would say in, in French. Um, and then in in the nineties, uh, mainly uh, shallow networks were used, and there was a theory developed for yeah about properties of shallow networks. And I want to to use that a bit as a starting point. Um, shadow networks are just networks with one hidden layer. And then um, what I want to do is I want to spend a bit of time on talking about what could be the advantage of having additional hidden layers. So that's not completely resolved yet, but we have some sort of ideas what you can do with uh, additional hidden layers in the neural network. Um, and then as a third step, I want to explain a bit uh, statistical theory now specifically for these uh, value networks, which are now the, uh, you see the, the benchmark for in, in, in deep learning that you take the value activation function and they have very specific properties that you can exploit. And um, so that will be um, a big and part of my um, lecture series. And then finally, a bit in the direction of also an outlook, I want to talk a bit about uh, the overparameterization. Good. Um, let's get uh, started. I have to go to the next slide. Let me start with the with the shallow network, uh, shallow neural network. Um, and suppose we look at neural networks that have just one output function. If, if not, it's it's not so easy to, and not so difficult to, to uh, change these formulas, but for convenience, it's uh, very, yeah, uh, natural to consider one output. Because then we can write down what to set on your network is we can write that down as a, as a function. So, and then uh, if we can write down as, as a function, then that is much easier to analyze uh, mathematically than if we write down some graph representations or so they are not very useful for mathematical analysis. So uh, a cell on your network, um, okay, so it's it's easy. So it's, uh, it's a function of the X, which is here. And then we take a, a scalar product with this uh, um, parameter vector WJ, so it's uh, a scalar product. And then we change the scalar product by another parameter that is called the shift or bias. And that gives us a, a number. And this number is then applied to an activation function that is a pre-chosen thing. Yeah? So before we've 
fit a neural network to data or so we, we pick the, the activation function and that's the real valued function and there are some uh, good choices um, and I'll come to that uh, later. Okay, so we apply to this this activation function that still gives us uh, uh, that's a real function, not real value function in, in X now and then we do that essentially uh, M times Okay, so M is another thing that is uh, pre-chosen. It's um, if you like these graph representations, it's the number of uh, hidden units and the and the the number of units in the hidden layer, and then um, we multiply that with uh, with uh, a parameter another parameter C J. Okay, so that's um, a function class, or if we look over all the possible parameter. Uh, configurations we get we get a function class if we have one fixed parameter configuration we get a we get a function from rd to to r uh, that's it um so now you can say okay that's not very not very exciting um so why is that now and that's a way to to build functions or so in, in in this form so before I, I come to that, let me first go to what uh, a deep uh, feed forward neural network is. Yeah? So there are tons of different ways of a uh, neural network. You might have heard about convolutional neural networks, or recurrent neural networks. And so the, the, say the vanilla thing and the deep uh, learning is that uh, we study these feed forward neural networks. They have the following form. And um, to introduce what this form is, um we have first to agree on a bit of, of notation so what i want to introduce is this uh, sigma v of um so it should depend on on y sigma v of y and um this is defined um to be this uh, the, the right hand side okay so we again have the activation function sigma and then we have two vectors of the same length say r and we subtract this vector component wise these two vectors component wise so y1 minus v1 to yr minus vr and we apply to all of the uh, differences we apply the the activation function okay so that is what sigma v of y uh, stands for that's just a, a notation that helps us later to present everything in a more condensed um, formula. Okay, so given this this notation, then we we say we have a network architecture, and the network architecture uh, consists of two things: a number l and a vector uh, p. Okay, so and um, the l is called um, the number of hidden layers or depth in uh, later, and so so l stands for for layers, and the width. Uh, is a vector that actually um, is of length um, the number of layers plus two. So the number of hidden layers is L, and then we have an input and an output layer, and the width essentially tells us how wide this neural network is in each of these L plus two uh, layers. That is what it stores. And these two things together, that's what we call this the, the, the network architecture. It says essentially what uh, how deep and how wide this, this this neural network is in each of the layers and if we now that's always something that is chosen by the practitioner so and if we have now agreed on okay let's look at uh, network architecture lp what is then a neural network with architecture lp well that's a function of this form so we have Again, an input vector x that uh, let's say in R D, um, which is a uh, say P zero is also uh, has to be set to be D, and then what we do is we we take a, a parameter um, matrix or sometimes called a weight matrix, and we multiply that with uh, the W the W zero is called, is the weight matrix, and we multiply that with the with the vector x, and that's matrix. Uh, vector multiplication so that um, gives us a vector and then based on this vector so that's the 
in this notation over here, that's the that's the y vector now. Yeah. So now we uh, look at sigma v1 of y. Okay. So we take a, a shift vector v1, and then we execute this this operation uh, uh, as as the using the definition above. Yeah. So that means if we are after we have done that, we what we get back is we get back a vector um, that is of length. Yeah, if we now use this notation, it's of length uh, uh, P1. Yeah, so P0 is equal to the input dimension, which we also can call sometimes D, and then the, the P1 is the is the vector length after the the, the first uh, activation function has been applied. And um, yeah, then we go on and we do that uh, essentially L times that we always alternate between matrix vector multiplications and then this component wise application of the of the activation function. Um, and after we have done that L times, then we also multiply in the in the so-called output layer, we multiply with another weight matrix WL. And the WL doesn't have necessarily a, a, another activation function. Here it really depends on what type of problem you are addressing. So if you do regression type problems, then you don't put an activation function here. And uh, for my talk, uh, I, I restrict myself to, to regression problems. If you do the classification, then what you want to do is that you, you want to map this vector into a probability vector, and then you apply the so-called softmax function here in the, after the output layer, and I have just ignored it. Uh, so I think we are good if we just take here the identity, don't think about uh, activation functions. But that is, uh, or what I want to say, somehow depending on the problem, you will have to to modify a bit the output such that the function also maps to the correct space. Okay, so that's the mathematical uh, formulation of a uh, of a neural network with uh, architecture LP. And maybe if you like an exercise, then you can easily check that the formulation on the page before of the shallow network that this corresponds to L equals one and the P uh, vector that we had is, uh, so it has, in, so it has, is a vector of length three, right? L plus two is uh, three. So it has this input, it has uh, uh, D, the input uh, dimension here, this uh, D. And then in the first hidden layer, it has um, M and the output layer has uh, one, one output. Um, and this, so it can be written also as f of x as a w1 sigma uh, v1 w0 of x, if you like. And so the w0 here, that is the um, matrix that contains w1 transpose to w uh, m transpose. And the w1 here is a, it's a, a c1 to cm Right. Um, so yeah. So you can just write it in, in this form. As it, it's a the cellular network is something more specific than the the feed forward neural network that we have been discussing. So the important thing to remember about cellular networks is that um, the L is equal to is L is equal to one. So it has one hidden one hidden layer. Okay. Good. So that's that's understood. Now let's. Uh, I go on. Let's uh, some additional remarks on on this. So, uh, why is it called the feed forward? Because essentially we we have these inputs later that we put in, in here, and then the inputs are passed uh, through these different layers in, in one direction. So there are no feedback loops and so on, and therefore it's called uh, a feedback a uh, feed forward uh, neural network and then there are other ones where you can go back and so for instance you have heard about the recurrent neural networks properly and so and there uh, so that's a that's a different story um and then what's very important is essentially that uh yeah it's uh, quite close to related to to this idea of also linear models so, so where we have uh, linear parameters but then the, the trick here is always that we have this uh, um, linear operations to matrix vector multiplication, and in between we put these these nonlinearities from the activation function. Um, other things that are important is uh, we don't learn, for instance, the, the network architecture that's that's given, and um, 
So the parameters, the, the thing that we really want to learn from the data, those are all the, the entries of these matrices W0 to WL, and also the, the entries of the vectors w, uh, VL to uh, V1. Yeah? So all of them are, are parameters that have to be later learned from the, from the data, and that can really be in the, in the order of millions of, of parameters. So these matrices can be very, very big, and the L can be large, and so on. Um, great. There's a, there's a question in the, in the chat. I'm very happy. Uh, thanks, uh, Romain. Um, is it possible to use different activation functions for different hidden layers or for different nodes of the same layer? Yeah, that's something that, um, in principle, uh, is another thing where where theory can help us. I, I believe in the in the long run a bit to understand this. So, at this moment, most of the implementations that I'm aware of, they use typically one activation function. But if we understand a bit the, the strengths and the weaknesses of these activation functions then um, I think we can come up with better um, network configurations where we exactly do what, what you propose, namely to, and some layers, for instance, use uh, splits, uh, but, but then the question is how to combine these layers and so on. And so just to give you one idea about uh, what that could be is, for instance, if you take, um, um, sigmoidal activation function, we, we come to that. And, and yeah, so sigmoidal activation functions and activation function, okay, so our sigma looks like this. So we, we have here zero, oops, and here we have one. And then we, so that's a monotone function that goes from zero to one, yeah? Monotone uh, increasing function from zero to one. So that's a sigmoidal activation function. And they are very good for for counting objects, for instance. Yeah, so if your features is something like counting, okay, so um, you, you, you have a dice, and so what you want is your classification problem is to, to say on which side of the dice is the, the picture, or so what, what side of the dice do, do we get to see? Then, then it's about accounting because you have to count the, the, the dots on, on the side, and then these sigmoidal activation functions can be much more useful because essentially it's sort of indicator functions so zero, one, so you, you can uh, count uh, the objects and you can sum them together. And the value activation functions, I think we will come back to that later. They are very good for if we want to learn something like, uh, if, if there are lots of uh, identity operations that are somehow hidden in the in the network and that have somehow to be, that are important, then, um, then the value activation is quite important. So you can't pass the identity map easily forward with the sigmoid activation function. And maybe I can, at this moment, it's maybe a bit hard to, to understand what I'm talking about, but uh, I will come back to that. And then otherwise, you uh, please remind me of that. And once we have a bit more of notation, I think I can better explain it. Um, okay. And um, then, of course, I uh, don't understand why, in, at least on my screen, the, the plot is not very sharp. Uh, that has something to do, I think, with the big blue button, because on, on my laptop, it was quite good. But here, Okay, so we have put this strange uh, plot here, and that is typically these sorts of plots is what you get uh, to see if you read in the computer science literature about uh, neural networks or deep neural networks, then they like really much this graph representation. And that's just another way to represent functions. Okay, so that's something I, I think I want to, to highlight here. You can, the, the, these functions that I have are written down before in this, um, in this formula, that is also something you can write down as a graph. And for some problems, indeed, it's, it's useful to think about these functions as a, as a graph. So, um, so the, the graph is as follows. You, you put the, the input, the x um, goes uh, in the first uh, layer, the so-called input layer. And then in between of the input layer and the, the output layer, where you have the responses, the y's, you have a number of so-called hidden layers. In this case, uh, there are two hidden layers. And the hidden layers, um, they contain a number of, of nodes. They are called uh, units in the computer science literature. And each of these units, maybe uh, this one here, it uh, stands for simple mathematical operation that takes the, the incoming signal, in this case, the, the X here, that is the incoming signal from the, from the uh, previous uh, layer.
then it multiplies this in chem, so may I write it here, so it takes the x and then it multiplies it with the parameter vector a transpose. Uh, it uh, applies to that a, a shift, a, a b, and then a, a sigma, the, the activation function. That is what is then sent to the next uh, units in the next hidden layer, okay? So that's how it works. And um, so uh, if you then, and for, for each of these uh, units, you have different, so, so that's the A and the B, that uh, they will depend on which unit, yeah? so that they can all have different parameters uh, in the feed-forward neural network. And then if you write down what all this means, then you come exactly to the formula that we had before. But what is uh, nice here, so, so with this graph representation, the L and the P, they get a, a good interpretation, okay? So the L in this case would be the two, so we have two hidden layers, uh, this one and this one. And then uh, the P, that's the, the width vector, would be, uh, so here we have four units. So in the input layer, we have three in the first hidden layer, three in the second hidden layer, and two in the output layer. So our P vector uh, from the network architecture would be four, uh, three, three, and two. Okay, so that's uh, maybe a way to think about that. Um, okay. So that's um, essentially all about uh, the graph representation. And sometimes we will we will also use it uh, during this um, uh, lecture. Um, okay. So then let's go back to the to the mathematical formulation. That is, I think, much better to for for um, mathematics. And um, yeah, some additional um, definitions here. Uh, we call this a, a sparse neural network if their weight matrices are sparse matrices. So what is a sparse metric? Matrix is a, a matrix that only has a few non-zero entries. Okay, so uh, maybe that's a uh, 100 times 100 uh, matrix. So that has, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's 10,000 entries. And then the, maybe the only 30 or so of them are non-zero. And then that is what we could call this a sparse matrix. And if the network is composed um, based on sparse matrices, then we call it a sparse neural network. And so what does that correspond in the graph representation? That means essentially that these, these errors that we uh, point to from, from one layer to the next layer, that we, we only draw them if there would be non-trivial signals, so if the, 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 then we can essentially get rid of these, these uh, most of these errors and that would then lead to a sparse graph as well where, where only a few of the errors are really present and uh, really uh, send signal along these errors. And uh, another thing is that we call it um, a, a dense uh, weight matrix if um, all of the entries are non-zero and uh, that means also that uh, between two layers they're fully connected uh, graphs in, in between. And then what I showed you before is already if, if L is equal to one, if we have one hidden layer, then this is what we call a shallow neural network. And by definition, um, everything that is larger than, has more than one hidden layer is called a, a deep neural network. But nowadays, if we talk about deep neural networks, then typically we assume that it's um, bigger than, much bigger than one, but uh, it's in the order of 10 to, to maybe 100 or sometimes maybe a thousand or so. That's a bit the range of the of the depth. Um, okay, so here's um, just to show you how the depth uh, evolved in the in the past years and um, but it unfortunately stops in uh, 2015. It's a plot I have taken from a from a different uh, paper that is uh, where I give you the reference. And um, so what you see, this is like the, the, the best performing neural networks at this um, competitions uh, at, this, at this conference. And what you see in the 2010, 2011, so the timeline goes from right to left. So that was the, back then they, they, they used a shallow neural network, they, they were the, the best ones. And then the, the AlexNet, so that was for eight uh, layers. Um, and then it went up to about 20 layers and so on. And then suddenly in 2015, with this resonant architectures, another very specific sort of peak for neural you know, network, uh, it increased to um, more than 150 and so on. It uh, keeps uh, growing in, in, in a way. So there's definitely a, a gain in the, in the depth um, 
but also there are some results that Quinton's tell you that if you take the neural network too deep, then you could get also a bit unstable after after a while. So there's certain things that have to be taken into uh, account here, and that's something. Yeah, for tomorrow I have prepared the uh, or, or student has prepared the uh, the, the uh, classification problem. And there, I think the, the default is maybe four hidden layers and so on. That is often quite quite good in, in practice, um, but it really also depends on the on the type of problem that you have, the computing power that you have, the number of samples that you have, and so on and so on. Um, okay, so that's uh, okay. That's a great another question now. Um, are the number on top of the bars the performance of the neural networks in detail? So that's the misclassification. Um, so uh, here you see that uh, about uh, uh, yeah, 25 to 28 percent of the test um, examples were misclassified. So that's uh, image, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's, uh, image classification. And then you see a big drop here with uh, introducing the, the eight layers uh, was uh, reduced to, to 16 percent. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so here I think in this uh, 3.57, I believe that's below that what the, uh, the misclassification of uh, the average human uh, so uh, for these image uh, classification tasks. Um, so that's uh, really indeed quite quite low and you see a, a big improvement in terms of performance based on this uh, more refined network, uh, network architectures. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Good. Um, Another thing that is a bit uh, troublesome for developing uh, mathematical theory is that typically the number of uh, parameters is much larger than the, the number of uh, training data that we have. So that is what in statistics, what we call a high dimensional problem where we take more parameters than, than data points. And just another um, plot that I've been taking from another paper, um, but it's very nice, it's very well done, I think, here. So you see that the size of these disks corresponds to the number of, of network parameters. So uh, here's the, the, the scale, okay? So for instance, this famous AlexNet, which is here in, in orange, okay, now it's green, it has about uh, 60 million uh, parameters. So, uh, and then the training uh, data set that only consists of uh, a bit more than a million example so you have about a factor of 50 or so um, more parameters than than training data and the classical understanding is that that for to, to learn a parameter you need a, a lot of data and so, so so the number of data and the number of parameters should always be much lower than the number of training samples and that's just the opposite in the uh, for the for the deep learning so that is imposes a big challenge um yeah um okay so and you also see of course the biggest one they are in the range of here maybe this one's in the range of 150 million and parameters and of course uh, that's also not uh, already also five years ago and so that, uh, there are uh, networks with half a billion parameters and, uh, and, and so on so, so it's uh, ever growing um and um yeah, so we, we have to, to think about it, how to put that into a mathematical uh, framework and how can we analyze them actually. Um, so now uh, that was a, a bit of short intro on uh, peak forward neural networks and I don't talk here at all about convolutional neural networks and, and other forms of neural networks, although they are probably very important for these uh, practical successes, but I just don't have enough time to do that. What I rather want to do is now I want to go a bit into the theoretical understanding for uh, cellular neural networks, and here we really go back to this uh, theory of the of the 90s. Um, so what you could wonder about is what are these functions that we generate with a cellular neural network, right? So I, I convinced you before that this uh, a cellular neural network can be written as a function of, of this form. Yeah, so here I, I replace the x by by a dot. So that's the input, just to to show that's the dependence on on this on this variable. And then the parameters that we have are these uh, vectors, um, and 
on these uh, real value parameters Vj and Cj. So that's all we can play with. We can then look over all the functions that we can generate with such a shallow neural network, and that forms the, the, the function class. And uh, let me call the function class calligraphic f with, um, it has uh, an m, that's the number of uh, uh, units in the hidden layer, so it's here in the sum, it's the, this m, and then the, the activation function is also, also pre-chosen. And uh, people were in the beginning mainly wondering this, yeah, that seems a weird class, and how large is this class actually? Is this every function is that somehow, if we make the m, this this number of uh, uh, hidden uh, units in the hidden layer, if we make that large, can we approximate every function with that, right? Because that would be very bad if you can cannot even approximate certain functions. Then that means that, well, you just functions you never you, know, you will never be able to learn them. Yes, yeah? so it's not about learning at all. It's just the approximation for every property. But uh, if, if there's no way to reach functions with this function class, yeah, then you will, if, if that is the true function, you have the underlying and the, the statistical model, then you, you won't have a chance to, 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 to learn this function at all. Yeah. Or what we can also, in a more refined question is if we have a function of a certain smoothness, for instance, or a certain structure, then we know that other approximation schemes, they get to quite fast convergence rates. If you look at uh, in changing the number of parameters and other methods, and then of course you want to compare it a bit and see whether that's the same thing. Yeah? So the number of parameters is somehow a good proxy for the statistical complexity of a, of a method, at least in the in the in classical framework. Yeah? So if we need to learn a lot of parameters, that typically means uh, instability, lots of variance, and therefore we typically want to have good approximations with few parameters of a function. Yeah, so that's a bit, uh, the trick. And finally, we can, for instance, wonder about specific functions, whether they can be approximated and in which form. And something that is, I think, in this structure, very strange is that, for instance, you think normally, suppose I want to learn something like a multiplication or so, I just have two inputs, yes, yeah? so and my vector x is just x1, x2, so the d is equal to 2. And all what we want to learn is, is the multiplication operation, yeah, so the output is the, the multiplication of the two, two inputs. Is that actually possible with such a shallow network, and how, should, how does it look like? Because in the shallow network, you, you don't have you don't see this multiplication structure anymore. So all what we have as an as a ingredient is essentially the scalar products here, and then we have we can add a parameter, and we can apply this activation function, but it's just, just something on the on the scalar product. And then we have another possibility here at a, a degree of freedom by, by adding parameters here and so. But we don't really see a possibility to to multiply to to, to numbers or so with, with, with such a function that the a function that approximates this multiplication operation. The multiplication is of course something super fundamental, right? So do you want to, that, that that should work somehow in a in a convenient way and that that's when, for such a structure it's completely unclear how that how that works. And um, so that's just uh, maybe some motivation on why um, one wants to study this or, or what type of questions one wants to formulate by analyzing such a function class. Um, okay, so now there comes the, the thing that is uh, now known under the name universal approximation theorem or uh, um, universal approximation property. Again, we look at, at the same class as before, and we look at this essentially as a sequence in the, in the M. And as we increase M, we get more parameters. Yeah, so in total we have m times d plus two parameters because we have this vector of length d and then we have the other two real value parameters vj and cj and that uh, adds the plus two. So that means if we make the m large we get more parameters and that is more or less linear in the, in the m or that's linear in the m. Also these uh, function classes they get larger because uh, you just add more summons to the sum here. So that's uh, the summation includes more terms, and then you easily can see that this is uh, 
a nested function space. So uh, if we make them large, so we can pick up function class. And what is now known to be the universal approximation property? It says that uh, a shallow networks with a fixed activation function sigma, they have this universal approximation property. If for any epsilon, any positive epsilon, and any uh, continuous function f on a compact interval, which we take here for simplicity to be 0, 1 to the d, uh, there exists an, a number of um, units in the hidden layer m that is allowed to depend it's allowed to depend on the function that we want to learn and also on the on this uh, epsilon such that um, in the supremum norm we can find in this function class f m sigma we can find an element that approximates this continuous function f up to an error epsilon okay so that means if we so this is our f and then we uh, that's maybe a bit of complex f, and then we need maybe, uh, I don't know, m equals 5,000 or so in order to build a network that, that can do something like that, such that it stays in a in an epsilon ball around the, the f for all times on, or on, on 0, 1 to the d. That's the, that's the question. And if the activation, if the activation function allows for such a property, then we say that that's the, the universal approximation property, and that's great because that means essentially all the continuous functions can be learned by the shallow networks, provided we put enough um, uh, enough uh, units in the in the hidden layer. Yeah, so that's a sort of a minimum guarantee um, that is uh, in order to make that really a useful method at, at all. It's it's not very great. Some people say because of this universal property, we will see that uh, lots of activation functions satisfy them. Uh, that's a good a good method. No, that's not the case. So that is actually universal approximation property is satisfied by tons of of different um, statistical methods. They always have underlying function space, and they they all typically all satisfy this universal approximation property. So that's not something very special. Also, it's really a sort of minimum requirement that this is not complete rubbish. This this uh, GT shallow neural network. Yeah. Uh, but this is also a non-trivial task already. Yeah? So how do we how do we prove this? Um, well, uh, the typical way to prove this is that one reduces that to so-called rich functions. And then we maybe explain it, and then I will uh, I will pause and make a five minutes break or so. I think uh, that, that, that uh, might be good with these online talks. Um, so just uh, the last slide before the break. Um, what you can do is you can first try to to look at this in one dimension okay so you look at this problem in in one dimension and you want then to to show that essentially this one dimensional function so then the scalar product here is just a, a multiplication with a with a parameter that these one dimensional functions that they spun spend the, 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 the space of, of continuous functions yeah? so every continuous function on on zero one can be approximated by a one dimensional thing. And that is much easier actually to, to study that in one dimension than in D dimensions. Um, because you don't have these these hyperplanes and the scalar products anymore. So which come through through this operation that makes it really, really strange. And for instance, you for value networks, what you can show is that these uh, these functions, okay, we, we haven't talked about value networks at all, but this is essentially all the piecewise linear functions and so in, in one dimension. So that's super easy to, to show that this approximates every continuous function. Yeah, so it's a bit given, I mean, it's, it's a, a quite trivial task. But of course, we want to do that in, in a much broader sense than just for, for value networks. So, so what I want to say here is the one dimensional case is, is, is considerably easier than the, the um, multivariate case. And that's exactly for this sort of thing what I talked about before, like the multiplication, that's a strange thing if you want to do that with a shallow neural network, but you, that's something that only exists in two dimensions or in higher dimensions. In one dimension, you can't have that. You can't have two different inputs. You just have one, one input. Um, okay, so um, also the, uh, yeah, so you don't have, have the scalar products. And if we, 
if you're able to do that, essentially what remains afterwards is that one has to show that, uh, uh, yeah, that these rich functions, and those are functions of this form, that they have the uh, universal approximation property. And here we are allowed to, to choose the functions gj. Okay, so before these functions gj, they were essentially fixed um, to be the activation function plus these shifts. And now um, we have uh, the flexibility to choose any function system that we like because we essentially can then approximate it in the one dimensional world by the sigmas and th therefore we can do this reduction. And that is uh, for rich functions, that's much easier than for the for the uh, given for given activation function. Okay, so that's uh, the, the trick in the universe approximation property to, to study it in the one dimensional case and then the multivariate case study that for rich functions. Good. Uh, is there any question at this at this moment? Feel free to erase to interrupt me to talk. Just uh, unmute yourself. Um, if not, then I would say yeah. We resume just in, in five minutes, and we have a short break, and then I will talk another fifty-five minutes. Okay. Um, so, and let's assume that the uh, activation function is, uh, has all derivatives. Yes, yeah, so it's a smooth uh, function and that it's not a polynomial. Okay. And then what I want to show is that this has the universal approximation property for uh, in the one dimensional case. So, first uh, about the uh, case that this is a polynomial. Um, suppose the sigma would be. Um, uh, sigma of x would be x squared or so, then you see that uh, uh, if I go back, you can see from this formulation that uh, universal approximation property cannot hold, right? Because if you have, uh, say, uh, uh, say x sigma is uh, x squared, yeah? So it's, uh, sigma is my pen. So sigma of x is equal to x squared. In this case, you get um, all the the, the quadratic functions in in x, yeah, the one-dimensional case, but the quadratic functions they don't span the the space of continuous functions, so that is not um, that's not that's not good enough, yeah. So you um, you you yeah by summing over quadratic functions, you still get quadratic functions in x, and so just the uh, quadratic functions are not good enough. So so the universal approximation property does definitely not hold for, for polynomials. And what is interesting is essentially that it holds for, in principle, everything else that is not a polynomial. So th therefore we have to put here a, um, a, a restriction that uh, the activation function is not a polynomial. Uh, okay, so then how do we argue now? Well, let me take you through some of the main steps in the proof. So we can, Look at the first uh, finite difference of the activation function at the point uh, t, and what we do is we uh, we scale it um, by by x h, and here we only put an h. Yeah, normally we would put also an x h in the in the denominator. I saw there's a question. I just finished this, and then I come to the question. So, okay, so that means essentially this thing here that will behave like x. Yeah, so if we make h small, then this will behave like uh, the the x times uh, okay, so that will times sigma prime of t. Um, okay, so we can that means essentially that by subtracting to to right, this is something we can build with one uh, with one unit, and this one something we can build with one unit, we can then um, subtract them because we can form this sum over the units and we can scale the output of the sum that was the, the coefficient cj before and so we can put the a, 1 over h we can put it in there so that 
this, this final difference here to delta H1, that's something you can build with two units uh, with a neural network. Yeah? So that's really exactly realizable by a neural network. In principle, we can also form something like a, a limit, right? that's the limit H to zero. Um, that's also uh, yeah, uh, possible to make H very, very small. We, we make the parameters very large, but then that, that's the thing. So, and what we now can do is we can iterate this thing, yeah? So we can look at the uh, case uh, finite uh, difference by just taking, uh, you know, in a re defining, it, defining it in a recursive way. And uh, by essentially doing the same arguments as before, we see that the k finite uh, difference that behaves like x to the k and then the k derivative, uh, sorry, the k derivative, Okay, that's almost unreadable at uh, at the point t. Sorry, not x. So that means if we subtract it, uh, if we divide it by x to the k and subtract the uh, the the, the k uh, derivative at t, we should uh, get something uh, that is close to zero. And uh, as h approaches zero, that is exactly zero. Okay, so that's the that's the thing. That's something we can we can do. Now oh, let's go to the next uh, slide. So if sigma is not a polynomial, then there exists for any of these uh, k, right? That's the order of the finite difference that we have been taking. There exists a, a number such that the k derivative is not equal to zero everywhere, right? That's just the definition of a polynomial that this is uh, that the k derivative is uh, zero, and then k depends on the on the degree of the polynomial. Um, okay, so what we can do is we can rearrange a bit this formula instead of dividing by x to the k, we can multiply by x to the k and then we can divide through, through this thing. So just to show you what the difference is. So before the xk was here and the, the k derivative at t was here, and now we just change that. We put the k derivative here and the xk here. So why can we do that? Because the, now we really use that, uh, we, we want the approximation on a compact interval and um, and then this is, uh, yeah, so the, the convergence is as uniform as it was before, so that, that is possible. And the thing is now, essentially with the same sort of arguments that I have been mentioning for the, for the first order difference, that this function here, that this can be realized by a shallow neural network with k plus one units. So we have seen that the first order difference needs two units, right? So that was um, here, this one. So this is one unit and this one is the second unit, so this one second. Uh, and so then we can exactly represent the first order difference. Now it's a sort of induction argument that for the case finite difference in the k plus one uh, units. And um, uh, that can be done for any positive h. Yeah? So if we now um, let h tend to zero, what we can do is essentially we can build something in the neural network that approaches the uh, function that maps x to the xk for integer k. Yeah, so we can uh, build that uh, with any precision because we, we can take the h. And if we can do that, we can of course build all the polynomials because that's, uh, but by just adding to the sum more, more terms, we can build all these functions xk um, for different powers of k and then we can uh, multiply them with uh, coefficients, we can write and we get any polynomial. And essentially, the, the final step in the proof is the Weierstrass approximation property that says, uh, it tells us that uh, on a compact interval that we have in this case, uh, the polynomials uh, are, are dense in the space of continuous functions. So that means essentially it's a sequence of polynomials that approximates any continuous function up to an epsilon. And that's exactly the property that we need to, to finish the proof. Okay, so that's the that's a bit uh, the argumentation here. Now I go to the to the question. I have to. It's a, oh, okay. Let me read it out. So I was wondering whether the quality of an activation function can be measured for a subset of continuous functions by studying the decay of m epsilon. That's the number of uh, units that we use for given epsilon in the definition of the universal approximation property. Would a quickly decaying m epsilon be beneficial in practice, or are the activation function in practice not optimized with respect to the decay of m epsilon? Um, yeah, uh, that's exactly the, the thing that we that, that we want to do later in order to to look at uh, um, to, to to look at uh, convergence rates. Yeah, so we want for 
a fixed number of uh, parameters, uh, we want a certain decay in the in. So, for instance, if we have a, a beta smooth function, beta times the principal in, in d dimensions, then we know that for many approximation schemes, how many parameters do they need in order to approximate it up to an epsilon. And that is exactly what we want uh, for the neural networks as well. And um, yeah, I will show you a number of results that exactly give you the sort of, of trade off. And that also shows that these neural networks are optimal in terms of, of convergence rates. And that is exactly what you what you're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So, um, yeah. Let, let me discuss a bit about uh, the proof because it shows a bit of the, the problems also with the theory here. First of all, it's explicit. Yeah. So you you know more or less what you should do in order to approximate it. If if, if I give you a function f, a continuous function, you could in principle follow this, this this strategy and you can build, uh, in, in one dimension at least, you can build a, a sequence of networks that approximates that. And that's of course uh, a good con uh, constructive is always uh, something that provides it with some sort of insight. And something which is a bit uh, an issue here is, if you think about learning, then we want, right, we use typically these sorts of gradient descent methods that start you, so you initialize at some parameter values, and then um, uh, you you learn, and of course, if there are the, the true parameters, that, or say that the best parameters, if there are a million or uh, two billion or so, then you have to learn forever, right? So you typically want that there are reasonably small parameters that work well, um, and uh, if there would be very large parameters, that would probably mean that the method to learn that would be very unstable. So that's a, something which is a bit a big drawback of this construction that. Uh, you have to let this h tend to zero, and that creates essentially very, very large uh, network parameters. Um, and then that's the that's the issue, right? Can that be learned by by a gradient descent method? Um, and then what is interesting is that we only use essentially one point of the activation of, of the activation function. Okay, so if we look into this thing here, all what we need is how does the activation function behave at this point tk? And the tk is chosen such that um, uh, that is the case derivative is, is non-zero. Okay, and for every k, it could be a different point. But but essentially, if we 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 look at yeah, suppose we could find for all k the the the, the, the same point. So so t would not depend on k. So then it and that is true for many many uh, functions, of course. Um, then that means all what matters is really like the, the activation function at one value. Okay, so the, the global behavior of the activation function does not matter anymore if it just behaves in, in, in this one point in the correct way. Okay, so that's also this, this very sharp phase transition that, that you get here. If, if you have a, a polynomial activation function, then you don't get universal approximation. Okay, I, I, I convinced you of that, but now you can put a little perturbation around here, uh, a polynomial function such that the whole thing is uh, still smooth, say, but it's still a super small perturbation. And then suddenly you get a universal approximation, so you can approximate all the functions, but the, the activation functions are very, very close. So you, so you would typically think, well, the function spaces that you can generate are also still very close. So they should not matter so much on, on a little thing in the activation function, but that's not true because in these constructions, you really zoom in at one point in the activation function. And that's, of course, very problematic from a, from a mathematical point of view, or also the, the practical point of view, because uh, that's, there's probably something uh, wrong here. Um, and somehow the, the global structure of the activation function should also be somehow important. And that's not uh, in, in this, in this uh, proof here, in, in a way. Um, and therefore, I think that the main issue here is really it is, um, it's a theoretical trick to let uh, parameters grow to infinity, but it's something we should avoid essentially in the theory because it leads to uh, results that are in theory true, but I think in practice useless. Um, okay, so there's another good question here, just to be sure when you say that the activation function is smooth, you mean C infinity. Yes, yeah, in this case, I mean really C infinity. But you can maybe have put it on the next slide. 
you can extend the universal approximation property. Okay, I, I put it on the slide afterwards. I think you can extend it to um, to also any uh, continuous activation function that is not a polynomial. Okay, so uh, I, I come to that with uh, like two arguments on the on the slide 19, I believe. What I want to do before, I want to to, to talk about the second part. Yeah, so we said well. The proof of universal approximation consists of this one dimensional case and then the yeah, rich case where we have to show that the rich functions are dense in, in, um, in the continuous functions. So, how does that uh, work? Well, there are different ways to prove that. Uh, or, and I just show you one way, which I believe is uh, like the average like analysis is, is quite uh, clear how, how, how that can work. Okay, so instead we don't have an activation function anymore. We have to sort of which functions, and so what we do is essentially we write the function in terms of the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform probably something you know is just given by my that, and then there's an inverse Fourier transform, which is one is the same form instead of the plusy instead of a minus in the exponent, and uh, and then we know that uh, we can write a function in terms of applying Fourier and inverse Fourier transform. We we get it back that gives us the identity. On suitable spaces, of course, of, of suitable function space. And now, what we can do is, of, for every complex function, we can uh, decompose it into its space and its absolute uh, value. And um, now, what we therefore can say, well, uh, if we have the Fourier transform of f, we can um, decompose it into the phase, uh, and then we get a function p of w. Okay, for every w, we have different, possibly different phase, and then the uh, the, the, the absolute value of the um, of the Fourier transform, and now the Fourier inversion formula. What does uh, if we write it out? Okay, so we have f of x, and then we have this form. So that's just the, the uh, this formula over here, uh, and then we can put a, a real uh, because it's a real value function. So we can put a, um, the real value part of that. We, we can interchange the, the integration and the real value part, and you get here the cos cosine out. Um, and now what you see essentially, this is uh, um, this one. You can write that essentially as uh, as this function g before. Okay, so and then it's a sort of continuous version of these rich functions. Okay, so that's an integral over g of w transpose x plus a plus a shift. Um, and then there's a weighting here. Okay. So let me go back to what the rich function was. There, oops, here. So that's a rich function. Okay. And so what we essentially do now is to write f as a, as an integral over a g, which also depends on a uh, on some parameter, uh, uh, say u and w a j of u trans x plus v of u. And then there's a du here, okay. And this integral and this summation, they're of course quite close because it's just by, by Riemann and uh, summation, we know that uh, somehow we can find sums that approximate these integrals quite well. Okay, so that means if we now go here, um, just, uh, then we have essentially an integral and if we do Riemann, uh, Riemann summation here, and we find sum that is very close to this integral and that is a rich, uh, that's a sum of rich functions. Okay, so the, and here in this g, okay, so I should have put the, this vector here that should also go into the, into the g, for instance, and then it's fine. So then it's just discretization of this integral and then we find that this rich functions, they approximate the function f arbitrarily well. And that can be done, okay, here's for all L2 functions. Um, and then, of course, we have to be, uh, argue here that also you can do that for any continuous function, but the, the, that's not a big, big step here in this book. Okay, so that's a, a, a bit an idea that the rich functions do to show that part of rich functions is not so, it's not so difficult. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I didn't put the slides that I promised would come slide nineteen, namely the what what was asked that. Uh, uh, C infinity activation function indeed. So what you can do is um, the extensions that you can also do the, the same sort of argument for um, continuous functions, uh, continuous activation functions. And what is the 
the idea here is if you have a continuous activation function sigma, okay, so that's not smooth. And what, what you can do is you can always look at a convolution. So you can take a sigma epsilon of x, that is um, your sigma of a u, and then you take a kernel of x minus u over epsilon or so d u. Um, and if the kernel is smooth, say a, a Gaussian kernel or so, then the sigma epsilon, uh, that will be a, a smooth function, okay? And then the trick is that if the approximate, the, the universe approximation property holds for sigma epsilon, then it also holds for sigma u that you can show that separately. Why, why is that the case? Because sigma u, again, it's like this sort of Riemann, uh, Riemann approximation or Riemann summation argument. So you can, you can write this out as a sum and then you can show essentially that the number of units with respect to the sigma you can represent essentially the action of the sigma epsilon and all this carries over then what, what you from, from sigma u to sigma epsilon and um, then you're back in the case where you are in the c infinity uh, world with the activation function you can you can combine these two arguments to show that for a continuous activation function similar argument also works for instance for a monotone activation functions that don't even have to be continuous so, so you can also show it the only exception where you can't show it and where it's also not true is uh, the case of uh, of a polynomial activation function um okay good uh, let me now go to the approximation rates um and now also just for the for the shallow networks and that's exactly what christoph asked uh, earlier um that would be more useful indeed for, for neural networks. And here, I just give you a bit of uh, an overview. I, I can't go re really much into detail, just some interesting uh, facts here. And I discussed the smooth activation uh, functions and approximation rates uh, using multivariate polynomials. And then finally, we go to the parents classes. Um, let me start with a smooth activation function. Now you see before, um, okay, so universal approximation holds for all activation functions. But there is something in, in approximation theory um, that will matter here. So if we have, for instance, suppose we take, maybe you have heard about splines or so in approximation theory. Okay, so splines, linear splines, is essentially all the piecewise linear functions that you, that you can form with a number of uh, uh, restriction on the number of pieces. So, so you take uh, these precise linear functions and now you want to approximate a smooth function with that. You, you can do it, yeah, so it's just uh, precise linear approximation, but you don't get um, very good approximation rates for that, okay, because the, you cannot somehow exploit the, the higher order smoothness of the of the function that you want to approximate. So that means if you take a, for your as a scheme to approximate a smooth function or a function of rough functions, then typically you 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 suffer for smooth functions. You suffer somehow. You, you need far more parameters uh, to approximate up to an error epsilon than a, a, a scheme that relies on 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 smoother functions. And that is typically something if you have ever in statistics encountered a kernel methods or so like a kernel smoothing method, then we have these sorts of moments, conditions, and so that have to be satisfied. And that is essentially exactly the sort of, of thing that, that is always in all these uh, approximation schemes. So that means if we take a activation function here, which is, for instance, uh, leads to piecewise linear functions, then we also believe that um, the approximation rates that we get are not very good for smooth functions. Yeah. Um, and so what's the, the easiest thing is really to, to look first to restrict to smooth activation functions because they have somehow in terms of approximation rates than the, uh, the, the best properties. And um, that's what uh, was done by, by in the paper Musker and um, 25 years ago. And then he looked in, in some sort of uh, smoothness on, on the function that we want to approximate and suppose that is beta times differentiable, or I mean, he, he defines it on L2, Sopolev uh, uh, sends the, the smoothness beta. Um, 
And what you can show is that then the approximation rate is m to the minus beta over d uh, if we take m units, okay? And with the, the, the dimension. So that, um, that means um, this is the, the epsilon, okay? And that's, uh, that's the m. Or if we, if we fix an epsilon, then this uh, Christoph's question was, we have to, to, to choose what is then the m epsilon. So that would be, okay, so we have to turn it around. So that would be epsilon to the d over beta, I think, yeah? That, that would be the, that many uh, units that we need in order to get approximation error epsilon. And that is uh, very much in line with the typical approximation schemes that we have in approximation theory. They all have exactly the sort of um, uh, dependence on the number of parameters. So you need uh, um, epsilon to the d over beta parameters in order to get approximation error epsilon. It's splines, wavelets, whatever you can uh, imagine what you what, what one could do. Okay, so that's uh, that means essentially okay they they get the the optimal uh, rates then. Um, okay, and so how does the, the the proof works? Yeah, well, it's always that um, that you first prove um, that it is um, that you can approximate uh, polynomials of these switch functions, and um, then it, it's the second part is that uh, um, that you show uh, approximation properties of of um, Polynomials. Okay, so that's the that's the proving strategy that leads you you there to this to, to show that. Okay, and then the next thing is um, another result that is by by Petrushev, a few years uh, later. And what he shows, and that is essentially given the discussion I before, that's essentially the, the, the important thing here, and that uh, something we will come back later to the deep learning case. That's something else I uh, he experienced there. That um, in contrast to other methods, you can somehow he shows that uh, up to a certain degree you can approximate uh, smoother functions than what you would expect if you take not a if you take an activation function that has a smoothness uh, s. Okay, so you would also think that you only can get the good approximate good approximation rates for functions that are of smoothness s, and if they have more than s derivatives, then it's uh, say s plus two or so then it breaks down but he shows that if the activation function is s smooth then you can also get this optimal approximation rate so that the same as on the last slide if the two function is as smooth as s plus d minus one over two okay so here the d is the, the dimension so in one dimension there's no gain if you're in several dimensions then these rich functions they they have very specific properties and um then you can also approximate smoother functions in a good way. So that's a, from an approximation uh, perspective, it's quite uh, quite a surprise in a way that you can do that. And but also that breaks down. And, and after this s plus d minus one over two, at some point you don't get the optimal approximation rates anymore. And here, what you see is that there's a sort of uh, dimension effect. Um, if you're in a high dimensional space, which most of them can assume down is, then uh, you gain a lot. Um, a bit uh, about the proof of this result. Well, again, uh, you, you just to yep. so, Sorry, can I interrupt you? I have a question. Sure. What, yeah, what, course, what yeah. do you mean by optimal with respect to yeah. what? Uh, so, uh, so optimal, I mean this thing here. So you need... Um, Say m parameters to get approximation rate m minus b over d, m minus beta over d, and what would be suboptimal if you would, for instance, need m square parameters or m to the 19 parameters to get the same approximation rate. And why is it optimal? Because essentially, and that's what in statistics always leads to, to optimal rates if you have such a scheme. Um, and um, there are also some notions in approximation theory that say that is somehow the the, the best thing one can one can expect. Yeah. But there's of course a trick with what a parameter is. So, so there are yeah. of course there are also some in this literature, maybe I've read about these papers by Meyerhoff or so where he shows that 
with nine parameters. So, so you can approximate any continuous function up to error epsilon. And that's, uh, but then you have somehow non compute non computable functions. And so, so our optimal is, uh, it's a bit it's like the, the, like for a reasonable approximation scheme, that is the, the best thing typically what can be, what can be achieved. But it says no, no strict mathematical definition here on the, on the slide. I have a question. Um, so you, you give a number of results uh, where you refer to rich functions. So uh, in rich functions, essentially, uh, you take a function and you rotate, you translate. So it means uh, compared to shallow network, to general shallow network, you don't have the additional flexibility of sharpening the ridge by uh, by a dilation. I mean, it's only uh, and so uh, so the question is, could you so, so then you recover result for Sobolev space or the Baron class? So what what is uh, can you give intuition? What is the additional gain? When you when you have the flexibility of sharpening the the ridge arbitrarily with your parameters, how does it enrich the class of functions, the approximation uh, class in a way, the the functions that you can approximate at a certain rate? Do we have do you have a result that go in the direction? Because the result that you are giving here are uh, in a way. Uh, Essentially, rich functions, not a shallow uh, network. I don't know. Yeah. Do you see my? Uh, am I? Uh, am I making myself clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I'm, I'm actually also a big fan of these results, and it comes, I think, also on a in a later slide. It comes um, back um, because I think this reduction to essentially you you always always take the problems to uh, polynomial approximation, yeah? yeah, multivariate polynomial approximation. So you always show that with your cellular networks you can approximate multivariate polynomials, and uh, then you show that based on existing results on multivariate polynomial approximation, yeah, this is part you get a uh, good rate. And um, so what is, uh, so, so I have I, I get some sort of feedback, maybe the, if, if you, um, I, I get my myself for the moment. So, so what, anyways, so, um, so what, what you can do is you can then, uh, in principle, you could start directly with um, multivariate polynomials as your approximation scheme. And that would make everything simpler, and you would get exactly the same sort of results for all of like this and the, the, the Petrushev result and so on. Yeah, so I think that is the main point of criticism that we we related to something else. And multivariate polynomials of approximation scheme is also known to be not very good. It has the, the, the right rates, but it's not very good. And um, we related essentially back to, to something else that we could have done right away. Yeah, so therefore, I think that there's really a, a bit. Um, a problem here in the, in the, yeah, what does it explain actually for cellular network? One, one more uh, uh, observation is, well, what you well can do is you can take as your, as a, if you have a rich function, we can take as a link function, we can take any function z, right? They are of the form gw transposed x, and the cellular networks, they are of the form uh, sigma w transpose x plus v. And of course, what you can do is you can take your function z of uh, say u that is just um, sigma of uh, u plus v right and then you get back the the cellular network so so in this sense you you really extend the the, the function class so it's a strict extension by uh, passing to to which functions and um, um, what, what is now my idea about this the whole thing is that suppose you would start right away with which functions then you would somehow you have to you would have to pick a function system G yeah there's, there's not one G there's a GJ so different uh, GJs you would have to to agree on something maybe cosine functions because they have good approximation properties that's essentially what I showed you on this slide here um, here in, 
that uh, if you take these cosine functions as uh, which functions they are good and or, or you would have to do something else and i think the flexibility of the, the activation function is if there's a good rich system then a shallow network could in principle learn that and could approximate this a good system and then use which regression based on this on, on the on, on the system which allows maybe for very condensed representation of the or approximation of the function that we want to to learn is that um, does that help a bit yeah well let me rephrase in more simple okay. terms in, yeah. in approximation theory for example we have a system we like to have a a clear characterization of the class of function that can be approximated at a certain rate so if i understand well for shallow network we don't have any it's an open problem to have a, a characterization an analytic characterization of the class of function that can be approximated at a given rate all we are all we know from what i understand is these these functions then uh, this smooth function can be approximated, but we don't know exactly what the characterizations, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, but this I think is inherent to to to, to nonlinear methods. So it's just a mess. I think there's no. I mean, in statistics we call it sometimes the maxi set approach, or so where we look at the the largest sets where we can achieve a certain rate of convergence. And for linear methods, some are based on wave plots or so that can be perfectly characterized in terms of piece of spaces or so. But if you take a nonlinear function system, that, to, to my opinion, that's that's that, that's not a solvable problem anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, very good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so let me go quickly through the and, and thanks for the question. Um, uh, yeah, um, I answered all the questions. So, um, to, uh, what, what is the proof here? Essentially, you you again a reduction to the rich functions, and then they use the the, the Radon transform. Yeah, so the Radon transform, where we have seen it, is exactly this. It takes a, uh, it, it represents a function in terms of rich functions. Yeah, so you take integrals, uh, line integrals, and you, you can view them as, as as rich functions. So, and that's also if you know what the oppositeness is of the the random transform that's exactly where this d minus one over two uh, thingy comes from here. So that's um yeah um it's in the oper in the radon operator essentially and then in the end yeah you know that the radon transform has also a polynomial eigen basis and then you can expand it in that and you can do approximation theory based on, on the properties of this eigen basis. That's uh, um I think the the, the main steps in the in the proof. So let me let me go on. Um, yeah, that's uh, also something we just said in the discussion here that you always relate it back to to polynomial approximation in, in a way. And then I think that the, the, the right comment here is to ask, yeah, why don't we start directly with polynomial approximation in the first place? Why, what, what what does it help us actually? Um, and that is something they can't that these results cannot answer really. And uh, what we want in the end, we want uh, results that tell us uh, like function classes. And that goes, I think, a bit in the direction of the previous question. We want to identify function classes where existing methods don't perform so well and neural networks can get better uh, approximation rates than existing methods. And that's, uh, I think, the, the next result is often stated in this form. And I will, uh, I will show you that I don't think that is also the case. But and overall, I think uh, I can already tell you this now. Cellular networks, first of all, they're not very good um, in terms of um, uh, learning and, and uh, pitting in cellular network is not a, a great thing to do. And that is, um, for instance, support vector machines because at the end of the uh, 90s, uh, just outperforming them. Um, and there is also no theoretical result that tells us cellular networks are better than something else or so. And so let me go through the Barron's result, which is a, a different type of approximation result. So Baron, uh, uh, so what he showed is that you can take as activation function, any sigmoidal activation function, again, those are just activation functions that are increasing from zero to, to one, say they're uh, uh, continuous, but otherwise you don't really need more, more smoothness here. And then you can, for any function f, you define this object here. Okay, so it seems very harmless. Uh, so it's uh, 
could think about some sort of uh, Sobolev uh, type norm or so. Um, but um, indeed, what it is, it relates. Um, you can convince yourself that you need a lot of smoothness to pick in order that this is a finite, that this is a finite constant. So the, if you think about the decay of the Fourier transform, and then you multiply it with a, a one norm, then uh, you need. Now I'm always forgetting it's d over two times difference of the functions or so, in order that you that this is a finite thing. So so the the smoothness at least has to has to increase with the uh, with the dimension. And uh, you don't see that anymore in the formulation, and that's also why uh, somehow hides that and why why it looks as if this can uh, overcome the curse of dimensionality, but indeed it's somehow hidden in the in the way it's 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 written. Okay, so suppose that's a finite constant. Then what uh, one can do is that uh, for every function uh, which is centered uh, around zero, but it doesn't really matter, is um, uh, you can find a shallow network with m uh, units such that you get uh, in an approximation weight um, that involves um, this CF, this constant we have discussed, uh, this one. And uh, it scales with a one over square root of m uh, rate. Yeah. And so what looks nice here about is that uh, the rate does not depend on the dimension anymore. So before we always had uh, OSCID, you need to uh, for um, yeah, m to the d over beta parameters, and if you have a large d, then this uh, uh, will give you a lot of parameters that you have to get a certain position. And here it seems as if this is not uh, not necessary. And therefore, it has often been argued that this is a uh, you know these neural networks they can overcome the curse of dimensionality. But what I told you before is essentially that you need a, a lot of smoothness on the on the f such that this is finite. So um, that's essentially uh, that's uh, the, the trade off somewhere here. Yeah, so if you have normally a rate, okay, let, let me come back to this before. So before we needed something like B over um, D over better many parameters to get a rate uh, one over M approximation rate M. So if the beta is of the order uh, D over two, yeah, then this becomes the M squared. Okay, so that means we need m squared parameters to get rate one over m. Or if we are here in this framework, if we want to get a rate one over square root of m, we need m parameters. And that's essentially the sort of story that is going on here. So you need to, because our, that the smoothness scales a bit with the dimension, um, you, it, it looks as if you can avoid the curse of dimensionality. And of course, it's not a one to one relation. So it's not exactly like a, every function, but a, um, there are bounds that tell you, uh, okay, now I'm, 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 I haven't looked at them for a while, but uh, it, it tells you that there's not so much space here and that, that there are also buffer functions that can have finite constants here. Um, okay, and so um, what I just argued about this, I don't think that there's something special here about uh, neural networks in terms of the uh, approximation rate. Um, and also, it has been shown that uh, using, uh, if you just use truncated uh, Fourier series, that you can achieve even a, a bit of faster uh, convergence rate. We don't have, um, sorry, no, I'm uh, somehow click on the wrong thing. So uh, you get the rate m to the uh, one over square root of m, and then there's an additional minus one over d term in the in the rate, and that has to do with the fact that the smoothness is not d over two, but I think it's d minus one over two or so. And uh, so like Fourier, Fourier series is of course super basic thing and uh, you don't need a neural network or so to achieve this rate, you can achieve even a slightly better rate um, with a Fourier series estimator. So there's also nothing new here for, for neural network. I think one has to clearly state that because often it's uh, somehow uh, mentioned in a different way in, 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 in papers that I'm also like recent papers that I'm uh, uh, studying and reading. And uh, of course, one can improve also the previous result. It's based on the probabilistic method, and uh, there's a, a better way to prove it. And then you can this missing minus one over d, which in high dimension anyways doesn't matter so much, but you can also get it back on your networks that are essentially the, the same as Fourier series in, in this case. Good. Um, and okay, so to 
to, to now come close to, to the end of my my uh, second uh, lecture here. So let me now show you what you can do in because now it's just approximation theory. And so how does that now materialize into statistical properties? And so here I follow this work by, by Baron. And um, so what he considers is um, uh, the um, IID samples, so we get inputs XIs and uh, YIs. And uh, what he does is he, he considers uh, the responses to be bounded by one. Um, yeah, and regression, that is not always the case because we don't want to do that for edited noise or so. But uh, if you think, for instance, about um, classification problems or so, then uh, why um, that's a reasonable assumption. And so what we want is we want to, to learn the the so-called regression function, which is just the conditional expectation of the y i is given that the x i has been equal to x. Yeah? And essentially that's uh that says is yeah if we know what x i is we can somehow that's the best way to predict what, what the y i is the y i is the function of epics. There's another question? Another question? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, so I heard some noise. If there's no questions, question, just, just, uh, just talk. Talk. No. And so what we want is so um, um, just um, uh, essentially, uh, essentially, yeah, essentially, I know it's a yeah, perfect thing where we thing have, have, have B0, 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 and then the F of X is the, what we have here is the, becomes in just the conditional class probability. Okay. And now, um, what we can study here is uh, we can study the, the empirical risk minimizer, and we can do that for any essentially that has nothing to do with neural networks. We can take any scheme that we a function class, uh, it could be neural network function class, but also something else, and then we we index all these uh, functions by parameter vectors uh, theta, which lies some space uh, capital theta. Um, and what Baron showed is essentially that you have to sort of what we call an oracle inequality. So the, that's the statistical risk. Okay, so that's uh, sometimes also the mean integrated squared error. Yeah, so it measures essentially how far we are with our estimator, the FET, the empirical risk minimizer. That is something we can compute based on the data. It's some statistical estimator. How close are we to the true function F that we would like to recover? And then measures that in the uh, yeah, uh, in the L2 norm, uh, typically weighted by the design, doesn't matter here, and then take the expectation. What it shows is that one can, such an oracle inequality shows that we can decompose that into an approximation part where we look at what is the best approximating element in the class, called here F theta. And uh, a second part that is essentially the variance part, so the approximation part is a bit the, the bias that we induce by, by using a certain function scheme. And the second part is the, the variance, and that depends here on the log of the cardinality, and we assume here in this result that we have just a discrete number of, of parameters. Okay, later that can be extended, but then I just recall this, this result, and then you take the, the log of the, the number of parameter configurations, so that uh, you have to have some sort of quantization or so for neural network to make it finite, and you need bounds on the parameters. And uh, but, but that gives you something if you stick it all in, you can compute a rate of convergence for discretized uh, neural network where you only can have the, yeah, certain outcomes. And of course, you need to do this discretization in such a way that you don't harm so much the, the approximation error here, because if you make the discretiz discretization too coarse, then you get a bad, um, um, large bias or a large approximation error. Um, and uh, yeah, so that is very generic. And now you uh, of course, very strong assumptions, um, but you can just uh, work it out. And if you um, if you would take everything right, then uh, so yeah, that's a balanced work. Or he discretizes the the network parameters, studies the empirical risk minimizer, which is uh, not computable for neural networks because also in the cellular network case, um, that is a non-convex optimization problem. Still, we can we can study it. So we have that uh, m times d plus two is the number of parameters, and what we get for the for the bound on the log of the number of discretized discretized points. So essentially, what do you do? So you discretize every parameter, and that is uh, all these possible 
configurations, that network configurations that create your, your parameter space. So essentially what you get is of course then uh, the log depends on the number of parameters. And since in the shallow network, we learned that we have M times D plus two parameters, uh, that's what you get. And where the log N comes from essentially because uh, you, you take something, right N is the sample size. So you take a discretization that is somehow uh, of the order of one over N or so. And then if you discretize it over a fixed interval, you get uh, another log n and the, and the log num and log uh, entropy to the key of, uh, of the space. Okay, and then if you stick everything together, and I'm ignoring here the dependence on the dimension that goes in more or less linearly, what you get are these two terms. So that's the approximation rate is one over m, right? I, I below I, first I showed you one over square root of m, but here we in the bound class, but here we look at the squared. Uh, loss and, and therefore this is squared so this is one over m and then the the number of parameters here that gives the m over m times log n and if it was the one over n that comes from the r inequality and of course it also requires that uh, that the cf constant that we had before and the approximation bound that this is also finite um, okay so now we get um, two terms in our way and uh, what we want of course we want a good statistical risk bound, right? We want the left-hand side, which says how, like how well does the empirical risk minimizer perform an average. Um, we want that to be small, right? Then this is a good method. And so how do we get them the right-hand side small? Because the, the M is something we can pick, right? It depends on the architecture. It's the number of units in the hidden layer. So that's something we can, as a practitioner, we can, we can choose. And so, of course, we choose it in such a way that these two terms are of the same order and with the, like, with minimizers on the right hand side. And if we do so, then we find that uh, um, we get uh, M should be like the number of units should be chosen of the order square root of N over log N. That's interesting because it shows us already here that the network architecture also depends a bit on the, on the sample size. So if you take a wider network, if you have more data points, and that's something that will come back again and again in the, uh, the tomorrow and during the lecture. And then if we stick in this, then you see the, 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 the squared conversions rate is uh, essentially one over square root of n. And that is a fast rate that does not depend on the dimension. The dimension goes in, in as a linear factor, so I haven't uh, uh, even written it down here. Um, but that is, um, yeah, that's a, a rate on, on, on the statistical properties of uh, uh, shallow neural networks. And that's essentially the, the, the first result in, in this direction. And it has been cited and uh, extended by many, many um, authors. Now, um, I'm close to, um, my time is almost up. And so what I just want to give you is a bit an, an outlook of um, what comes uh, uh, next uh, tomorrow. So what we will do is uh, we will talk a bit about what is the advantage of having additional uh, hidden layers in the neural network, what can we do? So I will talk a bit about uh, uh, the shallow neural networks you can't really localize um, certain con um, uh, things you can do better with additional layers. There's this sort of Kolmogorov analog representation phenomenon that shows that if you compose functions that you can get very, very strange properties. And then finally, I, I want to, to come to these deep value networks and show you some things that you can do with deep value networks that you cannot do with uh, shallow networks and shallow value networks. And um, based on that, we will then extend that and derive convergence rates for deep uh, value networks uh, in the same sense, like in the, the, that we get some sort of statistical uh, guarantees for deep value networks. And we will look at uh, different aspects of that. In the five time, I, I will talk a bit about this recent over parameterization, what type of theory you can, you can get out of it. And then we, secondly, we will also have the the, the computer session tomorrow, for which I can ask you to, to uh, install the, the TensorFlow. And then if you have a question, you can ask it now. And then otherwise, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Enjoy your day and Lumini and uh, see you tomorrow. Okay, there's a question, very good. Will it be possible to have an estimated value for M based on how the data are distributed? Uh -huh, for example, if some data are done, and I'm guessing that there's some kind of effective and uh yeah 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 um that's something that is just um always in, in statistics that uh we want the somehow the 
right? We, if we take serious estimators, also we truncate it, and that's um, it has exactly the same role as the as the M here. And there's certain strategies. Maybe you have ever heard about Lepsky method or so. Um, and in principle, these methods could be applied here as well to to select a good M. Yeah. So they are based essentially on a scheme where you try different M's. You start maybe with a small M and then make it bigger and bigger. And um, you then study essentially how the how the bias, you try to estimate the bias from the data, if I said correctly, and somehow if you see that the, the bias does not decrease anymore, then, then you stop. And uh, I think such a scheme would in principle also be, be possible here, but uh, probably computational prohibitive. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much uh, for the very interesting lecture. And are there any questions from uh, A1? Yes. Just uh, to understand well uh, the Baron class, the way you defined it, can you, can you return to the slide before? Uh, uh, no, before. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, so W1 uh, mm -hmm. is a discrete, is a little L1 norm? Yes. Yeah. Of W. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it means it's uh, the way you define it, something which is not in rotation invariant. Right, because uh, yeah, so it's yeah. not an isotropic. So, on the other hand, uh, the tool itself is completely rotation invariant, the approximation tool. So, how would you comment on that? It means it's uh, it's it's mm -hmm. not uh, <laughs> it's not an optimal result because uh, because you know that uh, if you can approximate f at a certain rate, you can also approximate the rotation of f at a certain rate. But, mm -hmm. uh, but the rotation of f might not satisfy uh, bound. Uh, the CF bound will not be the same. So <laughs> it means yeah, it's, yeah. It's, uh, it's, there is something uh, which is not uh, good here. Don't you uh, think I'm so? Not sure, yeah. 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 Um, just a short answer. I think there are some in statistics we like often also to consider specific structures. This is something that comes back to more, for instance, an ed edited model. Yeah, where we think, well, maybe uh, the function depends not like it is a sum of uh, functions that only depend maybe on one component or two components, each of them or so. And I think those are also not rotation invariant functions. And um, often we, we find the sorts of, of relationships and in, in data. So I think that that is probably not so a big problem from, from a, uh, like how we think about this in, in statistics. Um, but I think there are also results that extend that to the, to the two norm. And uh, what I can do for tomorrow, I can look that up to this more recent work. I, I, I think I've seen it and I can comment on what the change is for the, for the two norm. Yeah. So, and then I'm very sorry, I have to catch a train and I have to, to rush a bit. So I think uh, all the remaining questions, we can do that at the beginning of uh, tomorrow. And I can also extend a bit the, the session tomorrow. So thank you very much. And then, uh, yeah, see you tomorrow. Yeah. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah.